Hello, hello, everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to the MotorOne.com test car happy hour. Uh, I am here joined today again by some familiar faces. Uh, to my left, I've got Mr. Clint Simone up at up at the top. Say. Happy Friday, everybody. <laughs> and we've also got uh, Brett Evans as well, willing to talk cars, chop it up and, and have a ton of fun. I don't know why I'm using this from his backyard. What a bit. Exactly. Who wants to talk about some cars? Let's That's do right. It. I just I just drank a can of coffee and I'm feeling like some sort of announcer now, I guess. But we need um, like a monster truck, dude. Like a Friday, 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 <laughs> test car happy hour. Can you somebody, get us some somebody, for that? Yeah, somebody in the staff has got to have those chops to to pull it off. I'm not sure that it's it's anyone on this uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, podcast right now, but we'll we'll figure that out. I so I'm trying not to take offense to that. <laughs> um hey everybody so glad that you could join us um just to just to reiterate no matter whether you're seeing us on youtube or twitter or facebook um we are streaming live we are ready to answer your questions and uh feel free to all you have to do is leave a comment on whatever platform you're on we will get the question um and if it's not wildly inappropriate we'll do our very best to answer it um assuming of course we know the answer as well um so so please Oh my God! There, there goes the firework that lives under my desk. Um, let's let's go ahead and get started and stop talking about the environmental stuff that's happening here, or, or we're just going to go down a complete rabbit hole. Um, Brett, save me! <laughs> You're you've got the outlier this week. Clint and I are going to talk about uh, some electric vehicles, right? And I know that we've got um, some of our friends, hopefully from the social media, joining us to hear about some electric stuff. So. Why don't we start with the with the ice car first, because I know that it's a fan favorite and then we can sort of pivot to the future technologies. Yeah, I, I've been driving the last week. I've been in a Volkswagen Golf GTI with the Autobahn package, so it's fully loaded. Um, it's got everything you could possibly want on a modern Golf GTI. Um, and as you can see, it's beautiful King's Red metallic. It looks great. Um, I've really enjoyed it, um, but I did take some time to warm up to it because uh, we we um, do not love the interior of that thing or the uh, infotainment as a, as a rule. It's, it feels a little plasticky and a little dated already, just kind of not phenomenal materials. But then um, the infotainment is really where we, we have some serious problems because everything is touch sensitive, including the buttons on the wheel. It's really to accidentally activate, you know, your heated seats or your heated steering wheel when you're on the run, which is not something you want to do in Reseda, California right now. So um, a few problems there, but, but then again, you know, so my, my, uh, boyfriend is actually one of the larger critics of this vehicle because he really likes the Mark 7 GTI. Um, and uh, so we were kind of having a hard time figuring out, you know, who this car is for. But then we took it on a nice twisty road yesterday and it really just started to make sense. And this thing is so good in so many ways. It is just so, so stinking fun to drive and tons of grip and tons of power. And, you know, you see that you see the cockpit right there. You can see there's a ton of information available with the uh, digital instrument cluster and the um, the 10 inch infotainment screen. So, um, you know, keeping an eye on on grip levels and 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 fluid temperatures and everything like that. Things that you want to do in a performance car is uh, is all really easy to do. So um, it really kind of came good in spite of not really blowing us away at first. It really kind of came good with some cool, uh, some amazing driving dynamics. And then I also had the thought. And I'm talking a lot, so you guys can chime in in any minute. But I also had the thought that compared to the Mark 7 GTI, this thing is a, a slight step down in terms of interior quality. But compared to the likes of the Veloster N, the Elantra N, and the Civic Si, it is still right on the money. You know, it's still perfectly class competitive and, and very able to keep up with those or beat them out in terms of interior quality. So I've decided to, to forgive it that and really kind of just focus on how much fun it is to drive and, and, uh, and easy to live with on a daily basis. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point, right? Like uh, GTI has a has one of the most kind of difficult um, specs to hit in the entire industry, right? Because it's got to be in, in that in that class of car where it you should expect that it's going to be somebody's daily driver, right? So the stuff like the buttons on the steering wheel have to work, you, you really want to feel great about those. And at the at the same time, you want um, to you know you you need it to drive really well on a on a twisty road when that's the thing that you're going to do right that's why you buy the car for that that level of enjoyment so it really has to hit a lot of different marks uh to succeed and it's and it's tough when it doesn't get all those well i will say this i have not been in this gti i've been in a gli and i recently was in uh tiguan 
um, and with the same the same control and the steering wheel. I do not have the same issues that I think everybody else in in the group seems to have with like the accidental um, actuation of things or the. I know that there's a lot of complaint about like the volume slider not not working particularly well for whatever reason. Maybe it's like the the quality of my of the skin <laughs> on my thumbs, but like it seems to work just fine for me. So. I'm, I'm just- I'm going to say the only issue that I really have um, with those features, it's not necessarily that you can accidentally activate them or turn them on. It's that turning them off is like it, the system has like a lot of lag in it. So I actually only activated the heated steering wheel twice. Um, but both times this time around, <laughs> might I remind yes. you of our performance car of the year testing last year. And for yeah. what it's worth, this car won. This was our favorite performance yeah. car yeah. of the year. We gave it an award last year. That said, we were all mid lap at track testing at Willow Springs. Everybody's hands were cooked. It was impossible well, not to set off the heated steering wheel. Any sort of input. And, and if this part. That would be one thing if it was just accidentally turning it on and then turning it back off. That would be one thing. But there are three there are three temperature settings, so you have to press the button three For a times. Steering wheel and you it lags press it four times and it lags. So you end up you hit it once, nothing happens. You hit it two more times, nothing happens. You hit it one more time, and then you've just turned the system back on once it catches up. So that was my biggest problem. But to Clint's point, this thing won our won our the whole shebang last year, and it was up against mm-hmm. some pretty stiff competition with the BMW M3, and it still won. And that just speaks to how effectively they've nailed that like hot hatch, fun to drive right out of the box formula. It's really just, it's so great. I think where I'm at with it, and I'll get out the bias of saying I owned a Mark 7 GTI, but this car is fantastic to drive the Mark 8 and horrible to interact with on the technology side, which brings me back to a Mark 7 GTI. So I don't know what the incentive is in buying this, to be honest with you. It doesn't do one thing from a driving perspective any better than the Mark 7, at least in my opinion, having spent a good amount of time in both. Might be a little bit faster. I mean, dynamically speaking, they've done some things to change it. But what you're interfacing with on a day-to-day, just usability, livability ordeal, is it's not worth it. Yeah, I think, I think you guys are right. Like We have reached a point where, um, depending on your sort of ideal driving situation the thing that you really care about if if the thing that you so i should say if the thing that you don't uh, that you care the most about is the interior technology in a car the new cars are no question better than ever even if they can be a little bit finicky to use in in, in some cases that they the feature set is just wildly better the connectivity is wildly better like all the stuff that you're that you know connects up with your your phone and your own personal media and things like that far better today than they were even in a generation or a half generation ago right um, but the, the, like living with a driver's car stuff hasn't necessarily always improved with each one of these generations. And it's just a, it's, it's a really fascinating stage of, of kind of the evolution of, especially an enthusiast car like the GTI. So I just want to say hi real quick to, to Bossom A, uh, who apparently saw Lucid Air yesterday and is about to see a bunch of photos of one, uh, <laughs> in just a minute when we pivot here. Thanks for tuning in. Um, uh, if you guys have any questions specifically about, the Mark 8 GTI, um, or as we move on, any of the other cars, please feel free to put them wherever you're watching us, um, and we will we will answer away. Um, Let's talk about that Lucid. I need to get in a better mood before we talk about the Mini. <laughs> right on. Um, so anybody who is, uh, uh, subscribes to or watches our, um, other, our other Motor One podcast, Rambling About Cars, maybe you heard a little bit about this yesterday. Um, I was in uh, Northern California two weekends ago now to drive the Lucid Air Grand Touring and the Grand Touring Performance. Um, we have on MotorOne.com, uh, we have a first drive of the car. There's also one, if you happen to be tuning in from one of the Inside EVs channels, we have another first drive of the vehicle there um, from another great writer. And um, obviously we're creating lots of media around it because it's a really exciting vehicle. So um, the car that I drove, so the, the Lucid Air GT Performance is essentially just a fractional step down from the Lucid Air Dream Edition, which is the the car that Lucid kind of came to market with, made huge waves with earlier in the year. That was the one that had a a ridiculous 1,111 horsepower and 2.5 seconds, zero to 60, um, uh, just under 500 horsepower, or I'm sorry, 500 uh, miles of range on that one. Although the one version of this car actually goes... uh, well, there's one that's 520, I believe, and one that's 516. So just crazy range. Um, the car also critically has um, 
a 900 plus volt architecture too. So the ability for it to recharge is, is vastly superior than just about anything else on the market, right? It can, um, if, if you guys, maybe we can, we can offer some links here, but one of the things that I thought was really cool is that as we're learning about the car and getting some of the presentation and some of the research, our very own uh, senior editor at Inside EVs, Tom Malogny, has, did some charging tests on this car quite a while ago. And the Lucid folks are using his specs that he found from, from the, the actual real world charging tests to talk about things like um, getting 300 miles of range back in the battery with 21 minutes of fast charging. And this crazy peak rate of um, over, actually over 300 kilowatts, uh, which, is, which is just completely bananas. So, um, I love this car. Like it was, it was fantastic to drive. We drove it um, on some really, really windy, twisty roads where it held its own way better than you would expect a 5,200 pound car to, to do. Uh, the suspension response was really amazing. Um, one thing I thought was very interesting about this car, and, and then I'll stop talking and let you guys ask questions and weigh in, was the, it does have, the suspension setup is really cool. Although it does have active dampers and the damping sort of changes, the damping force changes, depending on which mode you're in, um, it still just has steel springs, right? Like it's not riding on an, on an airbag setup. This doesn't have an adjustable air suspension, which you would think, I mean, I guess in theory, it could be a, a detriment, right? Like there's a reason that especially big, heavy and very technologically advanced cars go that route. Um, you can just create a lot more variation in the, su in the suspension sort of feel when you're using airbags. Um, but there's something about having a really well-tuned steel suspension too, where they just dialed it in just right to work with the, the three different damper settings. Um, I think I mentioned in the article, it reminded me of kind of like a generation or two generation old, uh, BMW sort of seven series, right? Just like a really beautifully balanced driving character. That was something I expected it to be fast. I expected, you know, of course, all the power and acceleration. I did not expect it to handle the way that it handles. So that was, that was very exciting. Um, yeah, it's, super, super. It's interesting that you bring up the, the BMW connection because I, that's, I've heard that time and time again, you know, one of the, one of, uh, one of the other automotive YouTubers out there, uh, Jason Camisa compared it very favorably to a BMW E39 BMW M5, which is like the gold standard of mm. sedan handling. And, uh, and I, it's kind of curious to hear you say just exactly that, but what they've done is they've taken a relatively static suspension design and just made it work, which is, it's, that's a huge engineering undertaking. That's, that's very impressive. I trust in that company's ability to engineer the crap out of something. I mean, the, the charging rate you mentioned, just the hardware that comes along with it, it's extremely impressive. I not to get like all, you know, uh, deep into it on a Friday here, but my thing with Lucid is where are they going beyond this? This is an impressive product. I hope that it's not just a one or two product company that they come out with the SUV after this. But, you know, people were talking very favorably of Tesla, but didn't really take it seriously until Model 3 came around, or at least it expanded at such a rapid rate after Model 3 came around. So to make that more simple, I just wonder how big is the market for people who want a six figure electric vehicle? I don't think that they can just stop it here and an SUV with an equivalent price tag. Yeah, I mean it's a great point, and and yes, you're right. Clint. So we know um, they they talk pretty pretty plainly, although we didn't really see anything about the SUV project, the Gravity right. project, which is the next one out. And I think that the expectation is is that it's going to be sort of the SUV version of the Air, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is cool. And and I don't think it's a wrong strategy to do it. Uh, you know, again, like there are lots of new automakers um, and existing ones that have proven that if you can get people really excited about your, your kind of pinnacle, your halo product, um, you can sort of build that brand in a way that makes, uh, you know, makes people excited for, for something that's coming down market a little bit later. Um, I'll say this, and I asked a ton of questions when we were at the first, the first dinner and the first day of the presentation, um, we were at Lucid headquarters and they did so much work. And I think they kind of had to do this, but like in explaining their technology in sort of showing the difference between the really the the internal stuff you know we're talking about like the differential inside each one of the the two electric motors is really cool it's about this big you know it, it looks like the size of about a racket ball um and it's just an open diff that is nestled inside the mm. the um, e-motors 
um, that allow torque to flow freely to each one of the wheels. And it's super lightweight, super compact, helps to allow the entire packaging to be really small. Um, we talked a lot about like the manufacturing process that they had they had put together for their batteries, which which that were completely designed in house. Um, as is everything. Like we can maybe move to this a little bit later, but like Lucid is the most kind of vertical company I've seen in a very very long time. And so far as they have like they're really not picking up anything off a shelf somewhere from an OEM, another OEM, or from a big, you know, tier one supplier, they're building and designing so much of the stuff in house. And the reason that's cool to the point about like, what's next is when their focus is on efficiency of in the final product, all the way through the manufacturing process, what they're doing is not only creating an efficient vehicle, but they're creating an inexpensive way to make a really impressive product. Right. And I think what that means for the future is Lucid maybe has more ability right now than any other company in the space to to build something at a lower price point that will still have a lot of value for them. They can still sell it with it with a healthy profit margin, you, you would guess, based on some of the sort of phil philosophical ways that they've designed this, which I think pretends really good things for the future of of what's coming down into a realm where real people can actually afford it. Because this car is, you know, as it sits here is between 150 and $180,000, right? So it is not attainable for most people. Yeah. Um, I'm rooting for them, certainly not against them. I just want to see, you know, what comes after this because we hear it, especially now in pop culture a lot that electric vehicles aren't affordable for the masses. And I don't need to go down that you know, whole right now. This is a car for a lot of people, but at the same time, I hope the company evolves to serve more products for a wider range of people. Because what they're doing at the top of their product hierarchy, just their starting point is very impressive. And I think they could help kind of crack the code for the next generation of EVs too, with more futuristic technology. Is it is it a known fact that they're, they're planning? Because uh, I, I know we've reported in the past on a, uh, smaller premium sedan and a smaller premium SUV and then a pickup truck as well. Is that, is that just rumor mongering or is that a known fact? Have they announced any of those things? No, I don't know yeah. about a truck. That's interesting to me. That runs pretty contrary to, to this. Yeah. It's, they didn't say anything about that. They say uh, uh, Dominic is right. Like they're, yeah. they're talking pretty openly about gravity. Gravity is on the website. Honestly, there's some renderings of, of, you know, like vaguely obscured views of the SUV. So it's, it's pretty clear that gravity is going to take, is, is really going to take from where we are at right now with air. Um, I don't know. They, nobody, nobody was really committing anything to the record, but like, again, like as they're talking about building all this um, impressive sort of cost, low cost structure in their manufacturing process as like another element of efficiency, it just, you know, I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions like in the room about what that means for the future. Like how low can you go and still make money on the car? And of course they're not going to commit to say like, yeah, for sure. We can still make money on a $27,000 EV, but, but the idea is there, right. That they, they're, I, I think that there's every intention to be able to scale the brand um, in, in a much bigger way than it, than we see right now. And, and with an SUV. So we'll go back real quick to some comments. Uh, we've got Elmo weighing in saying, with uh, some some strong words, right? Uh, this is back to the GTI. The Mark Eight Golf interior is cheap and dull, all all caps. And then following that by saying the new Civic has the best interior in the compact car class. I haven't driven everything in the compact car class, but I will say the new Civic interior, just a base like standard Civic, kicks ass. Really, really good, impressive. Uh, I love it. So I have guys... nothing against my good friend Elmo here in his, his back to back comments. <laughs> Also, you have a friend checking in from Poland, too. That's pretty cool. I need to just have like a world clock in front of me during these things to see what time it is for everybody. Chris, I think you need to be in bed. <laughs> it's 10.15 there. He's got, he's fine. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, he's just partying yeah. on a Friday. I love it. He's Friday. Yeah, yeah. It's maybe a little bit past happy hour, or maybe it's a second happy hour. I don't know. <laughs> Whenever you want it to be. All we're insinuating <laughs> with happy hours that we should be in a good mood on a Friday. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, thanks, Tyron, uh, for watching. Even though uh, I guess Tyron maybe disagrees with Elmo about the the compact class interiors, which is good. We'll get a fight started in the comments. But yeah, um, 
Yeah, Dominic. So Lucid says its Elite platform is, quote, designed to enable multiple vehicle top hats, right? Yeah, it's skateboard platform, um, really, really malleable in terms of, um, again, scaling it up and down in terms of power, um, output, uh, range, and all those sorts of things. Basically, the, the battery and motors that they're going to stick in there. Um, there's there's every indication that they could go way up with a you know a tri motor um, version. Uh, I think and don't quote me on this because now I'm I'm conflating a little bit whether I got this from Lucid or from an, another outside source. But I think that they could go as high as 1500 horsepower. Like I think they could go like 700 plus horsepower from each motor um, for the yeah, areas that exist right now too. So, I just left that on the screen because I like the way Caleb is thinking over here. I mean, that design would just translate so well into a wagon or something a little bit more flowy than the sedan itself. The design is really interesting. Keeping in mind that we first saw the Air like years ago. I want to say like five or six years ago, and they kind of took their time to get to production with it. But that design hasn't aged at all, and it's going to have to last years to come, but really cool. Yeah, I think it looks great. I, I don't, I'm not like as bullish on it. It's, I, I think the design is spectacular and, and it's hard to miss and it's really going to win a lot of fans. For me, um, it's, it's maybe a little bit too blingy. Like there's a lot of chrome on it. The heavy chrome on the nose kind of like turns me off just a little bit. But there's no question when you see, and again, like when we're out there driving and, you know, you guys have done this, you're you're in a group of maybe a dozen cars, which is always sort of a strange thing anyways. I was looking in my rear view mirror on these, you know, some of these windy, twisty mountain roads and seeing two or three other Lucids coming down the road and, and they look like alien spacecraft for sure. So w whether I think it's completely beautiful or not, I do think that it's very impressive and I think that the... Um, the general public is going to react really strongly to seeing them um, when, as they start to ramp up production and more of them will be on the roads. I think we're going to look at those in 50 years, the same way we look at Citroen, Citroen DSs. I think that it's going to be like a weird otherworldly kind of design that everyone else can't, no one can help, but just absolutely love. And I agree with Glenn. I think they, they knocked it out of the park. And we've got we've got people weighing in from all over the world. So we've got HP uh, Tan from Malaysia, where it's only four twenty a.m. Hopefully you are. Drinking you I have questions about. <laughs> Absolutely, or maybe you've been up all night. Um, where else? Uh, Kevin Hawthorne, hello again, and he wants to know how the weather is where we're at. We're in kind of two different places, anyways. But I actually the weather might not be that different. It's it's in the high eighties here in in Michigan in uh, uh, the Midwest. Brett, it looks like you're broadcasting from somewhere more exotic than you actually are. I mean, you could have gotten the, away with like the middle of the Amazon. For the first time in probably two weeks, it's below triple digits here. So that's really nice. Taking advantage. There you go. Um, awesome. All right, guys, we've got one more car to talk about. Uh, again, if you, if you guys have more questions... <laughs> about either lose it or GTI, feel free to read them, let them rip. But in the meantime, uh, Clint maybe isn't having quite as good a week with his, his test car as I had the previous weekend. So I want to start by saying it's my fault. And if we keep that in mind, as I continue talking, I think that's good context. So I'm driving the electric mini Cooper, the S E, which is also a silly name, but that's a side note. I, like most other human beings in Los Angeles, do not own a home. We're starting with the my fault part. I do not have consistent charging at my home, right? That would rectify almost every problem I'm about to go into. But this is a car that is definitely affordable, especially if you want to go electric, and has a teeny tiny range. Uh, best case scenario is probably around 110 miles, but keep in mind that's if you juice the battery completely full, which you're not supposed to do. So more realistically is like 80 or 90 miles. This is the, I mean, I've driven probably 15 or 20 electric vehicles this year. This is the first time all year that I've had any sort of range anxiety. If you do not have at home every night consistent charging, it's just a non-starter. The price point is mm -hmm. extremely compelling, but it's it's constant your heart is just beating like this you wonder i just went to lax to pick up somebody from the airport last night and drove home and i'm looking at the gauge clustered constantly um and it doesn't fast charge at all it caps out at around 49 kilowatt or so so you can't even charge it up quickly to make up for it like it's to me this is not 
the electric future. It's actually representative of EVs from five plus years ago. I'll say it one more time. If you have charging at the house, you can make it work. But for anybody yeah. in an urban environment that otherwise could drive an ID4, that could drive an Ionic 5, this, despite its really nice price, just doesn't do it for me. What's what the is the price point? point? Yeah. So after incentives, you could get it for low 20s. Um, okay. And I get it. Like, that is fantastic. But for a range that's less than 100 miles in almost every scenario, yeah, oof. Here's, I don't here's like the it. challenge that I have with that price point is um, Chevy just announced that the the new Bolt with um, without incentives, the new Bolt's going to be about 25 or 26. And I was going to bring up what you just said. Yeah, that gets you 220 miles of range at least, you know, and and that might even be underreported so um, or or underestimated. So it doesn't have the style of the Mini. I mean, I know people love those four spoke wheels that the Mini has and all the little electric lime accents, but um, you know, same price and, and 120 miles more range. That's, that's a really hard, that's a really hard sell just for style. Yeah. I mean, it is fun to drive. I cannot take that away from it, but even when you get to back to like interior quality and things like that, it's really the tech. The tech is just a bad version of BMW iDrive. It's like somebody took all the good parts of iDrive and reverse engineered them to make them bad and hard to use. Um, like nothing about it has stood out as like really, really fantastic. This it's made me appreciate even the not so great modern EVs, even the ones that I wouldn't go by first still have much faster charging, still have a range of over 200 miles. And for me, who doesn't get to plug in a car every single night, I haven't thought twice about it. They've been extremely easy to live with. So this might be a car for the masses with price tag, but it's not a car for the masses with practicality. So let's let's back up a little and get some. We've got a couple of good questions, and I'll do uh, rapid fire to both of you to answer this. First of all, I'll shut up. Tyron Tyron Matherin, going back to the to the Lucid Air conversation, is rating uh, Tesla Model S at eight out of ten, the Lucid Air at eight point five out of ten, and the Porsche Taycan at nine out of ten. In his opinion, uh, Brett, you first. Yes, no, or other. On the on those uh, on those ratings, um, I'm gonna I'm ratings. gonna put, I think the Lucid is the best looking of the three by a by a slim margin over the Taycan. Okay, because uh, the Taycan's fantastic, but I think the Lucid just looks huge, large, in charge. <laughs> like it just it looks like a like a flagship to me. The Taycan looks like an electrified 911, which is wonderful. That's a great thing, but the Lucid just has presence, man. I love it. The Tyron scale. I like this as an official rating system. I don't think he's actually. I I looked at all three numbers. I agree with them. We are we are one in the same on these rankings. The Tycon is better looking. The Tycon is my favorite car design in the last few years. Honorable mention to the Audi e-tron GT mm. as well. The the Tycon sibling because oh my goodness, that's an incredible design. Go mm. Tyron. I agree. I, I think the Taycan maybe wins, has the edge, but I would only say because of the um, the uh, paint options. The colors on the that I've seen the Porsche in are are absolutely amazing, right? So, um, and and not for nothing, I actually still think like it's we're used to seeing it now, but like I remember the first time I saw a Model S, and and it kind of blew my mind. Like obviously, it's it's been a very successful design. I think the design of that car has been a good reason for it doing as well as it has. They get credit for coming out with a car in 2012 that still right. looks pretty fresh and modern today. That's, like, that's really impressive. You're not wrong. Yeah, yeah. You're not yeah. wrong. And I think that's how we'll be treating the Lucid in years to come as well. That car has to go the distance. They're not just going to rotate that out after three or four years, you know? For sure. Um, all right, let's one one more. And this is for you guys too, because I haven't driven them both. Uh, this is a, a debate that started earlier in the day. Uh, Mini Cooper SE or Mazda MX-30? Clint, I think we know your answer. <laughs> oh, God, that's a horrible choice. <laughs> that's like the uh, that's like the you have two bullets in your gun kind of choice. <laughs> it's, I think I'm arguing more against the situation than I am the car. The Mini does a good job of looking good and driving nice enough. I don't have things against it there. But for my situation, an electric car with 100 miles or less with slow charges ain't going to cut it. If I have to yeah. go between the two, I probably would go with the Mini just because I think it looks this much better than the Mazda. That thing is a little too avant-garde for me, but 
That's a really weird non-answer, isn't it? Yeah, you have to pick one. Final answer. Mini. Go. All right. All right. Mini wow. and I'm Not pissed. What I, I will tell you <laughs> and the rest of my friends about it on a daily basis. <laughs> All right, Brett, your answer? I go with a mini as well. I think it looks a lot better, and I tend to enjoy sm- you know, small, compact two- or two-door cars more than you know, pseudo pseudo crossovers. I do like the MX thirties RX eight doors a lot. That's kind of mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. But other than that, I do the mini. All right. We're I'm, I'm backtracking a little bit too. Hello to everybody that we didn't say a chance or get a chance to say hello to. Thank you all for watching and weighing in. Uh, we've got some good stuff in the chat from our own uh, Dom Yoni about Bolt EV range is now 259 uh, miles and easy to hit if you're not on an interstate. Um, we've also got, uh, Derek, uh, Canaceres. sorry, I'm murdering the last name. My eyes are bad. The mini looks nice, but they're not known for, but they are known. Sorry. I think what he means is they are they're not known, known for is making, what he said. no, they're, 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 they're not known for making reliable vehicles, which right, is where but, I think the electric comes in because there's a lot fewer moving parts on an electric than on you're a right. cars three cylinder. It'll be yeah. hard to break it. I agree. You'll just have it dead on the side of the road. Much as you may want to, um, and You're then still Gary Clark... roadside assistance, but it's going to be for range and yeah. not for break pay down. for the roadside assistance. Well, your friend, this was the the Lucid guys love this joke, but your friend in the Lucid Air can come in um, because it has bi directional charging can come and top off your battery with my the mini, much right? wealthier friend in That's the right. Lucid. That's my problem <laughs> That's right. too. The mini I can afford, and I can't even advocate for it. Oh, right. yeah. Um, Gary Clark, who I think has made it to every one of the uh, happy hours so far, except for maybe last week, maybe we just missed you, um, is asking, is it nimble? I think that was directed at the Lucid Air, um, but I'm not sure. I you think he meant there. Mini. Oh, Mini. Okay. Why don't we uh, answer so, both questions? That's fair. You yeah. first. For the Lucid, I would say, like, nimble isn't really a word that I would use. In, I mean, I, I get it. Like, it, it, it performed well, again, on really aggressive roads. But it was, it was really more a question of, of the suspension giving you the response that you wanted and sort of uh, smoothing things out where the, where the road is rough, where you've got like lots of buckling, small hills and things like that. It's still 5,200 pounds. Like, and th- the steering is well tuned for it too. There is very little feedback from it. So um, I would be, I would say composed, um, effortless maybe. I don't think that I would say nimble for the Lucid simply because of its size and weight. So mini yes yes is the answer it's nimble as all hell it doesn't even feel that heavy like it's fun to drive but it's not fun to drive because you're constantly looking at the the cluster in front of you to see how much charge you have left what's the yeah, weight yeah. on the mini do you know how much the mini weighs i can maybe pull it for you quickly no then, is the answer i can't i'm sorry well but the well, battery looking... is not that big it's 32.6 kilowatt hour so you throw that in a mini it's not you know it's not going to be terrible compared to modern or other EVs, too. It's, it's a, like about 3,100 pounds, says Google. So that's not bad. No, not at all. That feels like almost what a normal Mini could be. But um, finally, we've got, oh, now I lost the comment. Um, somebody who doesn't like electric cars at all. Uh, Fiston, who's got a very long <laughs> last name that I won't try to pronounce. Um, hello from Burundi. Thank you so much for tuning in. He hates electronic cars. Um, I, I think that's that's a perfectly valid uh, point of view. I, I, it may, might be a little bit short sighted because I think for any of us who have, who have now you know driven quite a lot of both electric cars and certainly a, a whole history of driving uh, ICE cars, we we would tell you that uh, electric cars are fun. They're useful. They can be practical in many different ways. Um, and absolutely, you're you're just going to see more and more of them as time rolls on. Um, but but. I, I think that there are a lot of people who still sort of share that point of view. My my contention would be, hey, you should probably go out and drive a few of them and then like come back and let's chat again and see if you still feel the same way. I, I can relate because uh, Clint last week had a very lovely BMW i4 and I took it for a spin and it was fast. It was it sounded cool. It was beautiful inside. It was great. And I really enjoyed driving it. And then when I was done driving it, I kind of just wanted to go back to my GTI. So I don't know. I can relate. I love yeah, that I four. <laughs> um, Dad says the Mini SE is the most reliable Mini. His problem uh, is autonomy. The next Mini SE will fix that in twenty twenty four. 
I'm not sure if Dan is breaking news here or not. I don't know if he works for BMW and and knows something that we don't. But um, certainly, people who are people who are really interested in, in electric cars right now are very interested in kind of the various sort of levels of of driving assist. I'm not going to say autonomy because there is not currently a car that actually drives itself on the road. I think that's a dangerous um, mistake <laughs> that has been re-reported lots of times. Um, at least, at least not in the U S and not legally. Um, but, but we're all very interested in cars that will have increasingly level, increasingly high levels of driver assistance up to the point of eventually being truly self-driving. Um, and that's a fascinating so, sort of story to watch unfold in real time. Um, as we're reporting on all kind of, kinds of car stuff, uh, day in and day out. So, um, I'm not quite ready to give up driving all the time yet, but I also work from home. I, when I commuted to Detroit, there are often times that I wanted to, uh, to let somebody else take the wheel all the time. So I get it for sure. Um, well, guys, we've run over a little bit. This is this is fantastic. We had a ton of engagement. Thank you all for, for uh, watching, for weighing in with questions. Again, if you happen to be seeing this a little bit later on, um, this, you know, we'll, all these podcasts are available uh, after the fact on YouTube too. You can feel free to leave comments there and we'll come back and try and answer them. Um, or just come and join us next Friday too. We do this every day. Or, sorry, we do this every week, every Friday at four o'clock. You can find us on motor1.com, our YouTube, our Facebook, and our Twitter channels. Um, so it should be should be pretty easy. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Have I'm going to go plug in my car. <laughs> do it. Good chat. All right, later.